All right. Welcome, everybody. This is our first buyer webinar of the year. This is pretty exciting. So we're going to kick 2022 off with a bang. Um, for those of you in the U.S., it's Groundhog's Day as well. So uh, another exciting milestone day here for us to have a webinar on. It's a uh, good time. So we're going to talk today about the next generation of contingent workforce management and compliance at scale. Um, so what does that really mean? I think a, a lot of programs out there really starting to think about some of those foundational components like our BMS and our, our MSP relationships, uh, how we work with suppliers, and we're starting to really rethink what does it look like for the future of these systems, these services, and how do we start to position our, our programs to be most successful in the future. So well, we're going to talk about that challenge I think that most programs are, are facing while still keeping an eye on that compliance focus and really how to, to scale the, these services, uh, we'll say regionally and across even different service areas. So pretty exciting topic today. Um, and we've got our, our sponsor here with us, Worksome. I'm, I'm really excited because they put together some, some great content for us and really going to take us through a, a pretty exciting discussion uh, as they look at this future of, of the, the landscape. Everybody is hopefully hearing me. That's our first challenge. So if you're dialed into our webinar and you are not hearing me, you'll find some audio controls at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can also use those controls to adjust how you, get, you connect to the, the session. Uh, and you can also, uh, I believe, adjust your, your devices there as well. If you have any questions, uh, I'm not saying right now, but as we get through the conversation, whenever you're ready for questions, we're going to be taking them through the discussion. So use the Q&A chat function within WebEx. Uh, hopefully you'll, you'll find that in the same place, that bottom control panel of your uh, WebEx uh, browser. And then if you have a question, like I said, we'll, we'll try to pull them into the discussion as we go. If not, we'll, we'll queue them up for the end. We'll make sure we address them. So we'll, we'll get to everybody's thoughts and uh, feedback through that. Uh, hopefully everybody's familiar with SIA. If you're not, just a, a quick overview. Um, SIA is one of the uh, premier providers of data and research to the staffing industry. Uh, really two sides of our organization, our corporate membership side that supports our providers, those service organizations out there that are creating all these solutions in the market. And we also have our buyer council, uh, which is those organizations that procure contingent workforce solutions and services. So um, we take those two perspectives. It gives us a, a really informed set of data and insight that we can take into the market for our, our clients. Uh, you're probably also familiar with our events. We're going to talk about some of those coming up here at the end of our, our presentation. Hopefully you'll be able to join us in person this year. We're going to get back to it, and we're actually going to be shaking some hands and seeing some people in person this year through a handful of our events. So looking forward to that. Uh, also check out our editorial publications. Uh, most of those uh, have no cost, so you can take a look at some of our thoughts and even some of the, the thoughts of some of your peers across the industry. Uh, and also, last but not least, think about our, our CCWP training program. It's a great time of year as everybody's refreshing their budgets and starting to think about their training initiatives. Um, if you're looking to, to get a little bit more expertise and understanding around the contingent workforce space, uh, take a look at our CCWP uh, as well as our, our Statement of Work expert courses. Uh, it's a great investment in your future and overall just the understanding you have around contingent workforce. So we're going to uh, hopefully reference some of the experiences of some of these organizations today. Uh, I mentioned my role. I'm Chris Payton, by the way. Uh, I support our, our buyer council for SIA. That's all these organizations plus some, uh, really helping to provide some advisory support and uh, help to, to really, uh, we'll say, address some of the challenges in the contingent workforce space these organizations have. So I'm uh, really thankful for this council. If you're interested in, in finding out more about how you can become part of it, uh, feel free to, to reach out to me and, and we'll connect you to uh, some of those services. So before I, I introduce our speakers, which I'm, I'm really excited to do, I want to open up a poll. Hopefully everybody just saw a pop-up within your WebEx window. Um, I want to get a, a chance to, to get a feel for who's in our, our audience today. So if you have a second, let's take a, just a quick look at the poll and fill in. What area of your organization do you support? Hopefully we captured all of them. If not, use that other function and, uh, and let us know here. We'll keep that open for uh, about another 30 or 40 seconds for us. In the meantime, let me introduce our speakers. So first, um, I, I got Matthias Linneman from uh, Worksome, our, our CCO. Um, Matthias, why don't you go ahead and say something here and, and tell us you know, who you are, what you do, and maybe some things you're passionate about in the space. Passionate, definitely. Very good to see you all. My name is Matthias. I'm a co-founder of Worksome. And um, what I do is I'm building a company um, of we're about 100 people. Um, and what we're building is technology for managing a contingent workforce. And I'm going to get more into what that means and how we see the future um, span out in terms of uh, the contingent workforce, the importance of 
it to stay competitive and some of the challenges that I think is important for companies to look into to do it well. All right, we're looking forward to tapping into some of that. Um, also, we've got Richard Lawson joining us today as, as well. Uh, Richard's the, the Global Category Director uh, for the Flexible Workforce and HR at Accenture. Richard, can you take a second and, and tell us about yourself and your role and some things you're interested in in this space? Sure, thanks, Chris. Uh, so as you say, I'm the Global Category Director for two categories here in procurement at Accenture, both the Flexible Workforce, which is all contractors, temps, services, statement of work that we buy, and also the HR category, which crucially for this environment includes recruitment and permanent talent, alongside things like learning, benefits, payroll, and the like. Uh, I'm excited to be here today, so thanks for inviting me, uh, SIA and, uh, and Matthias. Um, you know, I think it'll be a great conversation today looking at how tech, or talent tech as we call it here, can evolve, particularly around the talent engagement in terms of how talent is moving and changing, and it's moving and changing faster than we've probably seen it in the past recently, um, driving that total talent agenda, uh, utilizing that technology to help us do that, and looking at all those different skill sets, generations of talent that we'll come on to in the future. So excited to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Yeah, perfect. So thanks to our, our speakers for joining us today. I'm really hoping that we'll, we'll get some of that expertise to, to come out in the discussion. I don't think that'll be a problem with this group. Um, looking at our poll, so I, I don't think we have any surprises here in our poll data. Um, hopefully our speakers can see that info as well. Pretty fairly split between HR and procurement. I think that's uh, fairly standard for most of our audiences. Um, some interesting notes, though, 12% sitting within our operational areas. Um, I'd say maybe that's a, an increase, and even some legal representation across our call today. So I, I like that. Um, the others out there, the ones that we didn't even have a label for, but we talk about progressive. You all are the one that are finding new places to establish yourself, that you guys are, are finding that ult uh, ultimate space for uh, you know, to set that foundation for contingent workforce. I, I love that. So um, maybe we'll talk about some of that as well, maybe some of the alternate approaches that we're seeing in the, the contingent workforce space today. We run a poll at SIA. Uh, it's actually a survey that we complete uh, every year. It's our engagement manager survey. This is a, a great way for us to really get a good idea for some of the things that buyer organizations are interested in. So we reach out to individuals that run programs or have the responsibility for contingent workforce within their organization. We ask them what they have in place today and what are some of the things that you're looking to explore within the next two years. Um, let's look maybe at the, the left-hand side of this. I think this is interesting. When we say, you know, what's in place today, we, we see a pretty heavy uh, concentration of MSP compliance and, and VMS services. Still maybe a little bit of area to grow there, maybe to, to close the, the rest of the market. Um, we also look at some of these maybe newer uh, approaches like sourcing automation technology and online staffing platforms, getting a lot of interest in organizations to grow and to maybe uh, adopt some of those areas of, of services. Um, on the alternate side of this, we look at workforce strategies, and this becomes a, a really interesting conversation because we feel like we've got a pretty good coverage of diversity supplier programs and how we manage our, our staffing suppliers and that consolidation of staffing organizations. I think in today's conversation, and speakers keep me honest, I think we'll even challenge that and whether we're even looking at those areas in the right ways. Right? Mm. Um, I even look at some of these points like total talent acquisition, 6% in place today, one of the biggest areas of, of growth opportunity, um, even the one below that strategic planning for contingent workforce. These are all important for today's conversation um, because if anybody's been in the space for the last two years, you've been put on the, the radar. Right? I think the, the pandemic has definitely put a spotlight on our contingent workforce where having those conversations, and I think we're, we're starting to get some of the attention that the contingent workforce needs to be more of that strategic component of our workforce. So, uh, all but natural that we start to think about total talent acquisition as maybe the next step of that. So, um, I don't know if our, our speakers would agree to these trends if you're seeing the same things. Um, this is what our, our buyer audience is starting to suggest. I'm going to look at two of these trends. I think this is maybe the most important trend, the Friends we're probably most familiar with in this space. Um, let's look at our, our MSP and our, our VMS uh, adoption across the market. Uh, going back 10 years, and I think the important note here, this is America's data uh, that we're looking at today. Um, in the last decade, we've gotten more than half of the market on a VMS or, or MSP service. Um, these MSP services, I think the, the important note is this does not include our internally run programs. This is just that outsourcing of that MS or, uh, MSP service. Um, so again, we've um, we've had pretty good coverage. We've had a good saturation of these services in the market for a decade, and even had some growth uh, across some of these. So let's look at maybe an alternative graph, and 
This is one that every time I look at, I, I start to really scratch my head and, and wonder, you know, what's really happening with the net promoter scores of these services. So VMS and MSP, respectively, uh, on a slow decline for the overall customer satisfaction levels that we start to record across their, their tools, their services. Um, so, you know, I look at this and say, hey, customers, they're continually more and more unhappy, maybe uh, dissatisfied with some of these services or, or what they're getting out of these services. And so maybe as we start to, to cross uh, below zero, we start to be finding an inflection point and customer satisfaction and start to say, hey, something's mm -hmm. going to break here. And we've got to think about how do we make our customers happier and maybe do the, the things that become most valuable and insert the, the most opportunity for our customers. And as time goes on, I think this is an important graphic because we start to... Oh, Chris, yeah, ahead, Richard, there, please. Flip back a slide there. My, one of my observations from this slide when you shared this with me last week is, is that I wonder if buyers are expecting more, HR are expecting more from our MSPs and our VMS partners. And actually, although our, I think our satisfaction might be fairly steady uh, in terms of what we're getting, but we might be expecting more now because there's more innovative products and offerings in the market. The MSPs are pivoting. The VMSs are starting to look at how can they be more agile and obviously work some, with a new entrance to the market in that space. So I think I wonder whether it's a slight misnomer. I wonder if we're actually fairly flat and because we're expecting more, the line dips, dips quicker. That would be my observation. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, I mean, you think about that re requirement for more and more over time, right? I mean, I don't ever remember a time as a program manager where you stopped growing your abilities, right? Where you, you stopped trying to, to do things faster or at a better cost or at a higher quality, right? And so I think as we, we go through time, we try to build these capabilities, these maturity levels across our programs. Um, but you're right, year after year, we ask for more. We want to push the envelope and we want to start to, to see our, our programs uh, take on more growth and start to, you know, even do things more efficiently. And that becomes a challenge for our MSPs, especially when we're starting to negotiate these deals in three- or five-year terms, right, rather stagnant deals that don't allow for a, a lot of pivot through the relationship or become, you know, almost a friction point for that change and trying to adopt uh, maybe a new direction or a, a new approach. So you know, as programs are continuing to evolve, I think the last couple of years, that hasn't changed, right? More and more expectations on our programs. I absolutely agree. So let's um let's open up another poll real quick and let's see what the audience is concerned about in 2022. Um, hopefully we've got a good capture here of some of the things that are important to our our buyer organizations. We're gonna let this run in the background. Hopefully everybody can find that poll window and can come back and give us a response. We'll leave that open for about a minute. Um, and let's look at this and maybe I'll, I'll get some thought from our, our speakers here. I mean, we're definitely feeling the pain, I think, in today's market. Um, I'm most interested, uh, Richard, in the Accenture viewpoint, I mean, are, are these consistent pain points for your organization? What are the, the biggest challenges that you expect in 2022? Yeah, so as we, as we carry on evolving our program here at Accenture, we see all of these things that are on this deck here, on this slide, causing us issues. And actually what's interesting in a company like Accenture, you know, that's global, is that different ones will be different uh, pain points in different countries and regions, whether it's legislation driving things, you know, recent changes in Mexico has really caused some disruption uh, for us in terms of how we engage contingent labor there. Of course, we always have the European legislation, which can cause some headaches for people. But also from in terms of a performance point of view, again, I think we're asking more from our suppliers. We're asking them to find talent that might not even exist. We're asking them to find it quicker. Um, and we're asking them for that talent to be more engaged, perhaps, than we have done in the past, certainly in the contingent space, and be more aligned to that engagement we have in the permanent space, you know, with the ongoing engagement, the alumni programs and things like that that we have in PERM. And so that's some of the thing we're looking to drive in our total talent agenda at Accenture to make sure that we're treating all humans the same, with that, still with that line between contingent and perm, but making sure that we, we engage them in the right way, we engage them on a human level, and we continue to engage them even when they leave Accenture, or even if we don't employ them. You know, if we don't engage them as a contractor or a perm, they might be a silver medalist, I think is the favorite phrase uh, that people use in that. But keeping in contact with that so that you're not starting from scratch each time you're looking for talent. Um, the, the, the phrase we use at Accenture, I actually borrowed it from one of the MSPs, um, and if they're on, they'll know who they are. But we, we're still looking at talent rivers. Um, we use the word river rather than pool because we think a river's fresher. 
the tonic keeps moving in that, whereas a pool it can get stagnant. That's the idea anyway. So uh, we're driving talent rivers. We're driving that engagement. We're not there yet. We've got a lot to learn. We've got a lot to get through. Um, but we're making great progress, certainly in the last 12 to 18 months, faster than we've ever been. Um, so, yeah, th these things here are, are, are you know, pain points for us uh, and ones that we're, we're constantly looking to evolve and, uh, and innovate. And I think what becomes really interesting when you look at this list, and you know, I, I almost have this deja vu moment where I, I go back 10, 15, 20 years and you know, put myself in, in that kind of previous mindset, a, a lot of the same challenges that are starting to exist and that still exist in our market. Maybe we're just trying to look at some of these challenges and maybe the next level, uh, maybe reinventing how we solve some of these challenges and you know, even looking at some of the solutions that are available from a service and technology perspective and saying maybe we're, we're in a better environment. Maybe there's a, you know, a perfect storm happening to, to solve for some of these problems now but we haven't been able to successfully in the past. So uh, I like that idea of reinvention, right? So you, you talk about looking at talent, right? Uh, acquiring talent is a, a new challenge, right? I think programs have been looking at that being a, maybe a main driver to, to find and identify the, the right kind of talent across their programs. Um, so again, not a new concept, but we're trying to think of, you know, what are some new ways that we can start to think about that engagement? What's important through that engagement? Um, maybe getting away from the commoditization of that process. Think about the uniquenesses of all the different ways that we engage talent. Uh, Matthias, I know that's where we start to, to think about, you know, uh, work some maybe where, where you can start to, to manage some of that for us as well. I mean, are, are you seeing consistent challenges in the space? Yeah, tons. And um, if we skip ahead to the next slide, uh, I wanted to kind of zoom out and, and put some context into why we're seeing both challenges and opportunities in the space. And, and I think it's very important to kind of understand the root cause for this. And, uh, and some of the things that are happening out there which are very real is um, that there is a war for talent going on. On top of that, there is also uh, a great resignation going on. Um, so some of the latest stats that came out on these topics is that 58% of people in uh, the US this is, intend to resign in six months with 29% claiming that the resignation is a certainty. And that is especially happening in large slow growth companies which is massive. Um, we've seen a 23% increase in quit rate year over year across all industries, um, which just means that people are really resigning. They're leaving for other stuff. And some of the um, kind of root causes for why that is happening is that people see a lack of flexibility in jobs regularly. And they also see that um, the, there is simply better work available out there, which is the result of the war for talent. 54% uh, of companies globally report severe talent shortages, and we've seen the highest kind of talent shortage um, in 15 years is, is going on now. So this is, uh, this is really happening and something that's really important to understand because to me, you know, it means that if you don't understand how to kind of navigate in this space and really attract and retain the best talent, no matter if they're perms, contractors or whatever, um, you will definitely lose out uh, and, and lose competitive advantages. So the question is basically... <clears throat> just, to, just to comment on the previous slide from me, you know, in terms of what I talked about earlier when I introduced myself, the different talent that we're buying um, across all of the companies that are represented here today, but at Accenture, you know, we're buying talent from, you know, customer service representatives to executive consultants, and everywhere in between across all different geographies and lots of different generations of talent and every generation of talent wants to be engaged differently mm. so our traditional way of engaging talent contingent or perm has to evolve and has to keep pace with that um, and so that's where I think some of these percentages could be impacted on a on a company basis if you can do that really well you know and you can be agile with that and actually be accepting that some generations and some types of talent don't want to stay at Accenture for 20 years like me, right? They want to move on. They want to do something else. They want that gig. They want that freelancer, um, you know, life, work-life balance and all of that great stuff. If you can embrace that as a company, I think you're more likely to find the talent and, and actually build some loyalty. Even if that talent goes away for a year, if they've had a good experience at Accenture, they're, like, they're more likely to come back for the next gig. Um, and that's something we're really trying to drive forward at Accenture. I totally agree, and, and actually what we're seeing is that it's people in the midst of their career who is most um, prone to quit and resign because there is an interesting piece of work around the corner and because the risk of doing so is very low if you're highly skilled um, these days. So, yeah. very much agree. 
Yeah, I think this is, I mean, it's a simple supply demand, you know, challenge, right? I mean, you look at jobs rates. I think that's the other correlation to this. There's, you know, a, a jobs level that you know is meeting a, a pre-pandemic rate. Um, so the opportunities are out there, right? Um, I think the demographic piece is interesting when you you look at the the demand because the the population of workers, you know, I, I think while there are some workers in that kind of mid demographic that are starting to resign, there's also some some of those workers that are at the end of their careers. Right, that are opting just to leave the workforce entirely, and so we've got a handful of challenges I think that are starting to lead us to that great resignation. But um, regardless of what the influence is, it's starting to become overwhelming. I mean, we're, you start to, to show what was a 23 uh, percent year-over-year change uh, in that last slide. I think we set a record in, in November uh, for that, uh, you know, that end rate uh, being the highest it's been at I think almost three percent in November. Um, yeah. So that's you know very monumental. I mean, I think these things are, are noteworthy trends. Totally. And, and what we're seeing is that um, companies that are navigating this well, what they're doing is that they're not distinguishing as much between what's on the contract, if it's a permanent contract or a contract, a flexible freelance contract or whatever. It's more about finding that right talent and then being flexible in terms of also engaging them on their terms. So if you happen to find that superstar AI programmer, um, but the person says, I can only be with you three days a week, four days a week, then kind of being open to, the, to that, um, to, be, to basically access the talent and not just sit around and wait for that perfect kind of perm hire, um, which will take a long time these days. So the question is basically, is the flexible workforce the, the savior? Well, it's a good question, but, but the numbers speak for themselves in terms of that the flexible workforce is definitely on the rise. Um, we are seeing 34% growth in independent workers in 2021, now at 51 million in the US. And uh, now we have 17 million are working independently full time, up from 13.6 million last year. So there is a massive increase in the people who choose to work in this way. Uh, and I say choose very deliberately because we survey a ton of freelancers every year and have been doing so for, for the past three years. And the picture is super clear. They basically report that they are happier as freelancers. A lot of them report that they make more money, but most importantly, they report that what they value the most is the flexibility, the freedom to choose projects and the freedom to design when they work, how they work and how much they work and from where. Um, and that is often in the highly skilled kind of space more important than uh, than kind of security of income and uh, the other things that many companies have designed for for many 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 years so uh, yeah, i think matthias want another comment from me on in terms of is flexible workforce the savior i, I definitely think it's it's an element of 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 making up that talent jigsaw piece if you like you know our company and our business leaders are starting to recognize that the flexible workforce is a strategic option for them Whereas I think traditionally it would probably be fair to say that sometimes contractors or temps were sometimes seen as the last resort, um, and actually that's now pivoted. It was been pivoting for a number of years, but I'd say that's accelerated over the last 18 months or so, as even our clients are demanding us to be more agile. We therefore need to be more agile in our talent space. And it's great to see our business leaders at Accenture recognize that and actually coming out proactively to us and saying you need to build me a talent river, you need to do this in, in Europe, you need to do this in Brazil or wherever it might be. So um, really interested in this in this idea of the flexible workforce being the saviour. I think it's an element and I think it's a growing element. Yeah. And that's a perfect segue to, to this next slide in terms of the strategy, because what we're seeing is that companies that are winning in this situation have recognized strategically that this needs to be a topic. They are basically recognizing that tapping into the contingent workforce in an efficient manner is not about plucking gaps or like, you know, just finding talent quickly. It's about gaining a massive competitive advantage by having access to better talent faster than competition. Um, but what spoils the friction is often that, as we saw with your survey, Chris, on uh, NPS scores, that um, most large companies struggle with legacy processes and legacy technology. And I think there's, there's basically three kind of implications of that, which um, number one is like a poor talent experience, which is increasing in importance. Um, if things are cumbersome, if they take a long time, if they're not clear um, and fast, it's a problem and it will cause the loss of great talent. Um, and then kind of an example, slow processes around 
you know, all the things involved in, in, in onboarding talent, worker classification, timesheet approval, getting paid fast, understanding what to do and when, and, you know, background checks and all of that stuff. If that's cumbersome, it means that talent will find something else often. Um, and then there's the last thing, which is basically the risk of, of you know, misclassification, which was also on, on a previous slide, um, simply because it's often done in patchwork systems with many, many different touch points and so on, which confuses people and is prone to error. What are you seeing on, on, on this front, Richard? Yeah, so we, you know, our technology stack um, at Accenture is uh, complicated. <laughs> um, and we're working very hard in collaboration with our HR colleagues, with our with our IT colleagues, to to try and smooth some of that out, make it more efficient. And it's not necessarily about one tool. I actually think it's about a stack of tools working better together. And again, I don't think it's necessary they all need to integrate with each other perfectly, right? If there's some disruption and some friction, normally that means you're evolving and making changes probably for the good. You might make a few mistakes along the way, but, but you must learn from that and move forward and you'll end up with a better solution at the end. I think for me, some of the te technology in the market at the moment is really exciting. I think there's some great startups out there. I had a chat with one this morning that's, that's very small, probably not quite right for Accenture yet but really interested to see where they're going to go in the future. Um, and we have these conversations all the time. I'm always talking to our team about the idea of looking up, seeing what's out there, making sure what we're doing is still right. And if it's not, change direction, move on. And I think what's good at Accenture is that we are able to, to take a step back sometimes and look at our technology stack. And we have you know, the big players like the Workdays, the Field Glass, the IQN, we have all of those. Most of you that know Accenture know that. But we also have some of those smaller players like WorkSum, uh, who we've engaged with recently to help us solve one of our freelancer challenges in a couple of markets that we're live in, which has been really good because some of the legacy technologies aren't agile enough to do that with us. And so we have to be more agile to engage with the startups, to engage with the maybe smaller players who are more agile, can take some risk, and it does take some risk sometimes, both on the supplier's part and obviously on the supplier's part in the technology space as well. So I'm really excited about where we're going to go in the future at Accenture in this space. We're not there yet. Uh, we've got lots to do and lots to evolve, uh, but we're making great progress. Fantastic. And I think also kind of on, on the experience. So with technology in general, people just expect more these days. And um, PwC made a very interesting fun survey uh, seen from where I sit uh, that basically says that almost all C-suite executives believe that their company meets staff expectations with new technology. So that's great. <laughs> But when you ask the people who are working with that technology, uh, they tell a different story. And, and about 50% believe that their company meets their expectations. And I think the interesting point here is basically that if you think about your own expectations to technology, what you expect is kind of immediate resolution. It's um, imagine an Uber, it's you know one click and it's there. And that's kind of the same mindset that we're going through, I think, in, in especially in the technology that we're building at Worksome, is, is to simplify things as much as possible, automate everything that can be automated. So from a user experience, you can just click a few buttons and it's done and only have to decide on the stuff where you can have an opinion or where it helps the process. All the boring stuff beneath, that should be completely automated. But the perfect storm isn't, doesn't end there, and, and um, compliance is in the title of this webinar today, so we had to bring it up, of course, and there's a good reason for that. So we're seeing basically there's a war for talent and a great resignation. At the same time, um, governments are really struggling to figure out how to organize the workforce and, and organize um, social security on one side, but especially, to be honest, how they secure tax revenues in this environment. And therefore we are seeing uh, initiatives globally um, to, to kind of make sure that from a government perspective, uh, things are done correct and people pay their taxes correct. Uh, and what it basically translates into is an increased focus on worker classification. Um, in the UK, we have IR35, um, which is basically a very 
you know, probably the, the, the most kind of um, hard legislation on this globally where every contract or engagement has to be um, um, basically identified as either inside or outside, basically the equivalent of W2 or 1099. Uh, and it has to be done by the company and it has to be um, done before the work can start. And the company is 100% liability for any misclassification that is happening. We're seeing the same picture across the US, a bit more scattered across states and so on, but the overall trend globally is definitely the same. It must be, if you think about it from government's perspective, because when more people enter the flexible workforce and you don't have a good system to secure tax revenue, and also um, that's especially in, in the white color space, but also in the blue color space, a good system to make sure that people have the right benefits and, and kind of you know a net under them to keep them safe. It's a big problem for government. So this is something we're seeing um, a lot of increased scrutiny about and a big motivation for kind of looking into new technology because the risk is going up fast. Yeah, and I think some of this legislation has caused some nervousness in our buyers at Accenture of, of human talent. IR35 is an example you've got there. You know, in the UK, some of our buyers are, are much more nervous about buying temps and contractors now and, and feel and sometimes we've seen a bit of an impact of that, although our numbers are actually um, going up in that in that particular geographical market. Um, overall, there is some nervousness there. And so the way we deal with that is important to the company so that they know that procurement and HR together are building the thing that's going to help them and protect them against risk. And they can go ahead and get the talent that they need for the talent, for the quality of talent and the skills that they're buying. And they need to worry less about this legislation because we've got systems tools like WorkSum in place, for example, that help us get through this much quicker than we'll be able to do ourselves um, and in a much more smooth and streamlined way. Yeah. This never becomes an easy process when you start to think about, you know, not even having the same definition of, of these things from, you know, from, you know, one country to another, even from one state to, to another state. Um, you know, and I think even the, the approaches, you know, we look at IR35 being one approach, but um, you know, you come over to the U.S. and we start looking at things like AB5, um, you know, similar but much different, right? Uh, and how we actually apply and, and start to uh, analyze, you know, how, it, how how we start to you know, classify these workers, what that tax treatment should be for these yeah. government entities. So it's it's a challenge, I think, for organizations not just to be compliant, but to be compliant everywhere, right? Yeah, I agree. If you think about it from from one hiring manager's perspective. One day you're hiring a local uh, freelancer and the next day you're hiring someone abroad uh, and it, then in a different state and then you hire a short-term freelancer, then you hire a, a full-time contractor for nine months the next day and so on. And, it, and you know, imagine how much work there is to be done in kind of making sure you do this right and actually understand what the right process is. And that's a good example of where technology must be in place, in, in my opinion, to just make sure that it cannot be done wrong. There's basically rules implemented into the technology that means that every hire is taken through a predefined, um, vetted, and, and approved process. Very good. Um, so what we're basically coming down to is that, as we saw again on the NPS survey, a lot of technology uh, solutions today doesn't really solve good enough for the future. Um, we're seeing a lot of fragmented patchwork systems resulting in low transparency and slowness. Uh, slow time to hire. Often we um, we engage with companies that have a plus 20 day time to hire for contingent workers, and they're sometimes even proud of that, which is um, super long, super long. And um, it's also error prone, which is often accidental, actually, because there is so many process steps and um, different systems to to engage with, and the combination of that means that it's expensive. It's expensive often due to heavy kind of third-party supplier reliance, but also just because of the friction, the time it takes to do stuff and the loss of talent in uh, the mix of all that um, and the frustration is really, really adding up. And that has to be solved to, again, kind of turn the contingent workforce into a competitive advantage. Any points on this, guys? I was, uh, I was interested to hear, Matthias, your, your comment on the 20 days. Um, we're certainly proud <laughs> of a figure that is under 20 days. It is under 20 days, but globally. But of course, again, depending on the skills you're buying, some you can get in a day, right? You know, and some you can get in 35 days, actually. And you know what? That's okay. 
So what we have at Accenture is we actually talk about um, on time rather than how long it's taken us. How often have we delivered the talent on time? Some hiring managers are happy that actually their project is thought through, measured, and they know they don't want to start until April. Some want them to start tomorrow, so the, the amount we get on time is how we actually measure ourselves. We do have that overall global figure, which is under 20, I'm pleased to report. Um, but it's... Um, but yeah, I would say it's a, it's a combination of those things depending on the type of skill and, and talent you want. So I wouldn't personally get obsessed with that number. I would look at, you know, where do you need the talent and when do you need it for me is key. Yeah, no, I totally agree. It definitely depends on the type of talent you're looking for and where you're aiming to find them and, you know, the, the nature of the engagement for how long they are going to work for you and, and all of that. So you mentioned the, the patchwork approach. I, mean, I think it's easy to see how we've gotten to this place, though. I mean, when we go back over the last 10 years, it's not like we had, you know, this, this perfect window where we could map the entire process, knew what it was going to end up being and, and go solve all those connection points. I think we're pulling gaps as we go. Right. And it, it's creating this fragmented process, right, where we're solving problems as they come in a silo as opposed to looking at the, the right overall analysis and, and optimization. So I think that becomes exactly. important to, to look at the big picture for opportunity as opposed to just the, those individual areas where we've been really concentrating our efforts. Um, I, I do want to be sensitive to our chat because we, we have a couple of questions here. Um, maybe we'll, we'll roll back a, a little bit here, uh, Matthias, and look at some of the risk of our, our independent contractor populations. We, we talked about the compliance risks. Uh, maybe you can help us understand, you know, what some of the, the real risks are within some of these relationships. We've got a, a question here that uh, says that there uh, and this person asking the question is, having trouble uh, finding the right balance between using 1099s and their HR legal compliance um, and, and looking to uh, see how we're working through that in the U.S. And obviously they've got a payroll partner to help, but how, how do you start to balance some of that risk with some of the value of, of engaging this population or helping to maybe get past that risk uh, yeah. barrier in an organization? Let me just uh, jump uh, one slide ahead to, to kind of touch on that because I think what's important is to actually not think about what um, the classification will be and have a system do that. Just focus on finding the right talent and, and then engaging them. Um, payrolling partner, of course, um, payroll has to be, be done and compliantly, but again, it shouldn't really be up to the user. It should be done in a system that based on that worker classification done kind of in the hiring process, uh, channels that specific freelancer down the right route in terms of contracts, payments, or payroll, taxation, and all of that. And, and this slide kind of illustrates that in terms of, you know, on the right-hand side, the process uh, simplified. So posting a job or kind of finding a candidate, if you already know someone, no matter kind of what channel the person comes from, doing a worker classification right then and there, um, bringing that result into a contract, um, and then skipping on to, you know, the rest of the process, um, timesheet approval, submitting invoices, payments and taxes, accounting, reporting, and so on. And, and what we've seen is um, basically that we can cut the average number of process steps down from 28 to 8 in, uh, in this manner. Or that should be 9, because there's 9 uh, points on my slide. But, uh, but um, so I think it's... it's um, the wrong thing to do is not engage freelancers because you're afraid of misclassifying. And a lot of companies have done that, especially in the UK based on IR35. They basically did a blanket ban and said we're only using you know, W2s or inside IR35 freelancers now, which is totally wrong because that will limit your access to the right talent tremendously. We have a, a few other questions. Do you want to go through them now, Chris? Yeah, let, let's take a look at it. So uh, I had another question that just came in um, saying that for their organization that really the, the contingent workforce might be more of a, an afterthought and it's, it's challenging to, to drive strategy. So maybe some thoughts uh, from, from the two of you on how to sell a contingent workforce strategy like this to your, your business leaders yeah. and, and maybe to your business owners as well. Sure. So for me, it's less about selling contingent talent and more about selling all talent. So when I talk to leaders at Accenture, I'll talk to them about all the talent that they might need for their particular part of the business. And that's going to be a workforce mix of permanent talent. In the main, most of it will be permanent talent. And then also the flexible talent or contractor talent. And then oftentimes the services and statement of work type talent we might buy under a deliverable basis as well. 
And by showing that whole mix, you can show that there's a strategic element for each of those. There's a, there's a value in each of those that's slightly different. It might be flexibility, it might be speed, it might be quality, it might be loyalty, it might be understanding of culture, um, you know, uh, both geograph uh, geographically but also your company culture. So by showing that whole picture of talent, you can then show your client or your organization that flexible workforce isn't an afterthought. It's a, it's a strategic part of your talent planning and a strategic part of your integrated talent mix. Agree. Right. All right. Um, also, what we're seeing is that, that um, a lot of companies are today kind of relying on what you know, we would call a patchwork design, and they tend to crack under pressure as the volumes go up and the scrutiny around um, compliance and worker classification. It's simply difficult to manage all of this. And this is, you know, I don't want to dig too deep into to, to this, but you can basically see that, you know, as an organization, as a, as a company that uses uh, contingent workers on the top, what you often have is, is a managed service that uses a VMS to organize vendors, recruiters, direct hiring, um, talent pools, and all of that across, on the left-hand side, everything from finding talent, contracting, um, payments, and insights, and so on. Um, but these steps are often done in different systems based on the channel, right? So if you're a hiring manager and you hire via vendor one day, and then um, from your direct talent pool the other day, things like time tracking, timesheet approval, communication, doing worker classifications and stuff like that very often happens in different systems and it's 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 just really really prone to error and slows uh, the the entire value chain down the other things um involved is that it often results in super low transparency so it's hard to kind of analyze where costs are sitting and um, get a transparent and real-time overview of what's really going on and therefore it's hard to kind of strategize because you don't really have the insights around what's going on and in each layer here and what's kind of slowing the process down. There's another... So, uh, Matthias, real quick, uh, just to, to help maybe address a, a question in the, the chat as you're talking about costs. Um, in, in the current market, is there any insight around maybe recommendations on strategies for, for managing these costs or, or getting that insight specifically into these costs and we yeah. see best practices there? So the, the reality is that um, wages are going up as well as you know the price for hiring a freelancer that is just a reality so it's it's hard to kind of go for a strategy where you want the average pay rate to go down for uh, freelancers that will just result in you having less access to the right talent um, can be done via outsourcing um, to third you know third world countries or whatever um, but that's a very difficult uh, thing to kind of do at scale and really rely on having innovation capabilities as good um, with that. Uh, I think one of the one of there's basically two major drivers for cost savings as as we see it and, and with the clients we work with. One is um, to lessen the dependence on vendors to find um, freelancers through, um, because the markups are generally high um, and um, and often also not transparent. And, um, and the second one is time to reduce the friction drastically and basically have your people spend way less time doing all the stuff, which means that you can save people in finance, in hiring, in sourcing, et cetera. Um, and, and I'll get back to kind of the results of doing that and how much you can save. So, so stay tuned towards that at the end. Um, but I would say this, these are kind of two routes to go instead of kind of aiming to hire cheaper talent. Yeah, and I agree with what you're saying, Matthias. And I think, the only thing I would add to that is that when a uh, you know our leadership at Accenture say, well, this is this is too expensive, or or the bill rates, or the markups, as this as this questioner is asking about, is a problem for us. I would try and take a step back and show them that if we were to get that talent quicker, which might cost us an extra ten dollars a day, twenty dollars a day, whatever the fee might be, right, a hundred dollars a day doesn't you know whatever the fee might be and show that by landing that talent three weeks earlier, they will be on client site, driving revenue and providing profitability for our company. And obviously at Accenture, we, send, we spend a lot of our contractors onto our own clients. So there's, a, there's probably a different dynamic for other companies. 
but even for our internal contractors that we consume. Again, if they can land quicker, they're going to help the other teams. That means the teams can go and add their intelligence to the work that they're doing and then drive evolution quicker, innovation better um, and faster from that point of view. So that's something I try to try to do. I'm not always successful in that. <laughs> of course, sometimes cost is a, is a problem. I'm not saying that's the, the, the only answer. But for me, that's one of the tools I use to show the more holistic approach to cost. And as, as Matthias says, wages are going up. But what we're seeing, and I've got some evidence of this actually sent to me this morning by one of our key strategic partners here at Accenture, telling me that if I was to increase my rate by X, I'm going to be more likely to get um, more candidates, better quality candidates, and therefore those things I talked about, about revenue and profitability, will land. Yeah. So, so Richard, that's a, I mean, that's a very forward approach, right, when we start to think about this. You know, I think for most MSP organizations uh, or program offices, it's hard not to live in that day-to-day -day transactional cost savings mindset, right? The, the what's your, your markup percentage or, or how do I save, you know, $2 on this? How do you shift to that then? I mean, you know, to start getting away from that, you know, on paper, you know, cost savings, you know, on an annual basis to here's what we were able to do uh, effectively for our organization and, and quantifying value uh, being delivered. I mean, that, that's a big leap. Any thoughts on how to get there? Yeah, it is a big leap for sure. Um, and, you know, uh, procurement organizations obviously often get a bad name for only looking at savings or cost savings. Um, in Accenture, we rebranded our procurement function to Procurement Plus. Uh, very simple, little plus at the end. But what we're trying to show with that is that we're beyond savings. We're beyond that. And we're here to add value to the business. We're at the table with the business, hence our discussions with integrated talent planning, with HR, hence our discussions with our strategic supply chain to drive better value in a more holistic way. I'm not saying Accenture's got it right and perfect. We haven't. There might be people on this call that know who I am and, and are thinking, hmm, that's not quite right in my particular geography. But generally speaking, that's our vision. That's our mission. And that's what we're trying to do in procurement. And, and actually what we're doing is working much closer with HR now than we've ever done before, much closer with the business than we've ever done before. And by doing that, again, and I know I'm talking about the whole thing each time, but I do believe in that. I believe if you've got the whole picture, you're more likely to make the right strategic decision rather than the shorter term tactical one. Hmm. Very interesting. So um, we kind of built a four step checklist in, uh, in terms of kind of, you know, assessing if you're ready for tomorrow's challenges um, speaking about, you know, the big picture talent scarcity and, uh, and fragmented technology and stuff like that. Um, and, and kind of, you know, wanted to, to discuss this. This might be a little bit kind of brave in terms of like stating stuff, um, but this is basically what we're building for and what we're seeing working. Um, so number one is, is to go for one unbroken workflow, uh, one end-to-end -end platform. Uh, Richard, I know you challenged this a little bit, but this is basically what we're building, um, fully automating the steps included in stuff like worker classification, background checks, ID checks, all of that stuff kind of happen in the same flow. Um, and then designing for speed. Going back to, to the slide with Uber, basically, you know, this one click um, to hire almost, um, which is really, really interesting. Um, number two is integrated talent pools or talent rivers, um, which is a massive driver of cost savings. A lot of the companies that work with us have more than 50% of their contentious work, workers work for them more than once. And a lot of them have also had a big reliance on vendors, um, suppliers, recruiters that add a hefty markup. Um, and what we do is basically automatically kind of track ownership periods and bring that talent automatically into the direct talent pool, lowering the fees on average from 20, 25% down to about four or 5%, um, making it much cheaper over time um, to, to hire the same great people that you already work with. Um, then it must be compliant and automated so no one can hire without following the same pre-approved pre uh, process, which means that you cannot kind of make wrong. It's all in the system and it's, it's very clear what you're supposed to be doing, uh, both sides from the hiring manager and um, the candidate side. And of course, cost efficient. So um, total transparency so that you can actually strategize and forcing uh, talent into these uh, direct ta talent pools. So I, I go back, I mean, I'm going to put my, my MSP and, and VMS hat on and, and kind of look at it from, from that lens. I mean, isn't this really the, the overall 
expectation. I mean, hasn't it been the historic expectation that we get to the simple of a, a checklist, right? I mean, I, okay. is it oversimplifying? I mean, isn't this what, what everybody's trying to, to get to ultimately? And is this realistic? I, I think definitely uh, everybody's trying to get to this. I do think, however, a lot of companies um, in reality have this picture happening where it is a patchwork of systems. It's uh, low transparency. It's, it's, it's easy to make errors unintentionally. And it takes a lot of time, and um, and it takes a lot of people to manage. Um, here's an example of kind of how to really, really simplify it. And there's basically in our process, and, and Richard, jump in and, and please tell us a bit about the Accenture uh, framework, which I know looks a bit like this. Um, but there's essentially four steps. Essentially, it's simple, right? You find someone, and you want to bring that person on site or you know uh, remote, but able to work. Um, and this is the process, and th this is what we tell users to only be concerned about. Now, um, you can break that down into to, to this process as well, kind of starting from the left going to the right. And this is only, only what you should be concerned about as a user. And all the things that we automate underneath that is things like this. So kind of approval for budget to be allowed to hire a person, sourcing, screening, worker classification, generating a contract, handling disputes around worker classification, all that, um, making sure that IP uh, rights are owned by you as a company, NDAs, all the way to billing, payments, reporting, insights, and, and auditing, um, which is very important as well, um, looking at, at the risk of miscompliance. And here's some examples of stuff that kind of comes into the next layer. Um, so, for instance, with sourcing, allowing companies and hiring managers to tap into your own talent pool or talent river to hire that pre-vetted talent way cheaper and faster um, but also tapping into marketplaces of freelancers where you can kind of browse through skills and availability and location and experience and so on and of course kind of being able to work with all the vendors that you do need um, also uh, sometimes to find that great talent um, but basically making sure that no matter which channel you use the same process is followed um, over to worker classification and then all the way to kind of handling payroll and tax automated and so on. Um, so Matthias, I just, just as, you, as you mentioned our circle, so it's, it's not exactly the same as this, but we have a circle that starts with plan. So that's planning the talent, integrated talent planning uh, that I've talked about a bit today. Then we get to find, same as you. Then we talk about enabling that talent, and now I am moving into the contingent workforce world, not permanent. So you're enabling that talent. You're then managing that talent uh, to a certain degree, of course, within the rules of legislation. And then you're exiting that talent as well, something that sometimes people forget. You, you do have to exit, and you have to do it in a measured way. And then our little circle in the middle talks about engagement continuous engagement with that talent at the planning stage, at the managing stage, even at the exit stage, and then continuing to engage with that talent. So a similar sort of circle um, and one that we, we continue to evolve and, and, and optimize as we go through. Yeah. The, we just had a question. Um, we're starting to get interest from business partners in apps that provide pre-screened candidates that do not integrate with our current MSP and BMS, BMS program. Does anyone have experience with how to utilize these types of offerings? Um, from where I sit, I would say that um, if there's no possibility for you to kind of utilize marketplaces and talent apps and so on, uh, because it does not integrate with your MSP and VMS, which we see happening quite a lot, then the problem is probably with the MSP and the VMS. Um, it should be so that you as a company should be able to find talent wherever you want and it should fit into kind of the systems you have in place to organize that talent. If not, then that chain is broken, and if you do not have the opportunity to tap into talent marketplaces, freelance marketplaces, et cetera, then that's going to be a limiting factor in, in terms of, you know, your capability to access the right talent, for sure. But it does, um, it is a challenge, for sure. So you, you get thrown talent at us at all times as buyers in procurement, as I happen to be, or HR. You're getting thrown talent from all sorts of angles. It might be a, a random agency. It might be one of these more, you know, uh, pre-vetted apps that you're talking about in that question. And as, as Matthias says, it's, it's about accepting that and trying to be as agile as you can to bring that talent in, even if it means doing some of that red tape. And Accenture has a lot of red tape. 
behind the scenes after the fact, right? Do do the absolute compliance first. I'm not saying skip compliance, but make sure that you're you're allowing that talent to enter your company. Otherwise, you're missing out on talent. And and again, I'm not saying you know that we've got it perfect, but we we do try and be agile with that um, and allow some flexibility within our rules. So we call our rules guidelines that can be flexed. We call them print. We actually call them global principles. And then we allow local influence is what we call uh, is what we call it. So that we do have some flexibility, but within reason. Yeah, we uh, we kind of have a joke going on in in Worksome saying that the last thing the world needs is another a, another source for talent because there are plenty of sources. What's needed is better organization and better integration. Um, just kind of uh, mindful of the time, so we also have time for a bit of discussion. Um, some of the results that we've seen from companies that are utilizing this process and basically kind of seeking to automate all of this stuff with, with Worksome is an average saving of 8% uh, across the entire contingent workforce without compromising the quality of talent, which is super important. Um, and that happens again from uh, uh, less friction in the process and then a um, kind of automated way to become less dependent on expensive third-party suppliers over time. We're also seeing 30% savings on external fees via these um, third-party suppliers um, by kind of forcing maximum um, take rates and automating ownership periods so that they cannot own talent for more than, for instance, nine months, and then it goes directly into your talent pool and so on. And we're seeing a 90% reduction in the invoice volume. Um, as well as process steps going from an average of, of 28 down to, to 8. Um, we have had a record uh, of a one-day one time to hire um, when finding new talent via the marketplace, but the process on average when you know which freelancer you want to hire until, until you know the entire process of worker classification and um, contracts generated and basically being able to start to work takes five minutes, and that's yielding significant cost savings. Awesome. So I'm sensitive for, for time here. Let's um let's see if we can squeeze in. I think we can get one more question in uh, from our audience. And I, I got to say, I, I love our audience. They've been very, um, you know, very attentive here, asking some great questions. So um, maybe this is one for uh, Accenture. Um, Matthias, I know you've got a view on this. But when we start to think about automation of the process and really connecting all of these points, there's still a people component that we can't lose sight of, right? And so how do we balance uh, the, the need for people in a process versus just the, the pure automation of systems? How do you know where to have a, a people process versus a, an integrated process? Yeah, so it's a great question, and um, it's one I ask myself, especially when, you know, a company like Accenture, have, we have lots of bots, right? If I've got a question about how to buy a pencil, I ask a bot. If I, In fact, if I've got a question about how to buy a human, We've got a bot for that, and the bot will come back with an answer. And, and it's not. And the thing that I struggle with in, in my world is that by humans, is it's never binary, ever. It, there's never one answer. Very rarely. So how do I buy a temp? The answer comes back from the bot. It's not quite the answer I wanted, so I go back, and then the bot says, "I'm oh, sorry about that. I'm still learning." <laughs> and really, I just want to talk to a human. Right, so, so we encourage our teams um, at Accenture to keep picking up the phone, keep pinging on teams. We use teams here, you know, um, and we're, we're really strong about that and, and keeping that conversation flowing it is difficult, um, and that's talking about the internal piece. And then if I look at the talent, the people that you're talking to, the candidates in the marketplace, again, we, we encourage our supply base who, utilize, who we utilize a lot Make sure you're having that conversation, making sure that you're engaging with that talent. And I use the word engagement probably more than any other word um, at the moment and, and have done for a period of time. Engaging that talent. And it's, it's more than a candidate experience. It's talent, talent engagement is what you need. And so by continuing to do that, but utilizing technology where it makes sense to enable you to have time to talk to people. If you utilize tech to take out the inefficiencies, speed things up, um, then that's a good thing. And that should allow your team more time to have those human conversations and contacts, which actually builds the loyalty. That's what talent want. And that's what um, I think will enable all companies to attract talent better. Awesome. Humans, uh, gonna, should do much, yeah, I think better, and, uh, and talent uh, and, and technology should do the rest. 
as a guideline. Awesome. And, and what a great way to end the, the webinar. Um, you know, some great expertise from our, our two speakers here today. I, I want to say a special thank you to Worksome. Um, you guys have been great to you know, help share some of this content you've been seeing in the market and really helping to, to look at this in a, a very progressive way. So thanks for, for your support here. For all those of, you, those of you that are joining, thanks for your participation as well uh, in joining our event. We're going to leave you with some resources here after this event. So um, if you get the deck and you want to click on some of these and you have some questions, feel free to reach out to us afterwards. If we missed your question, we'll make sure we reach out to you directly and do some follow-up there as well. Um, hopefully we'll see all of you in person at some point this year and not just virtually. Uh, our first opportunity for that is going to be CWS Summit Europe. We're going to be at the Royal Lancaster in London on May 10th and 11th. Hopefully we'll, we'll see you there. Richard, maybe we'll even see you there, possibly, yeah? Um, if you, you can't make it across the pond and you want to hang out at our next North America Summit September 19th and 20th, and don't forget we've got our gig economy following that event right behind it. Where we, we shake up the audience a little bit and we bring in our provider community to make those conversations really interesting. So uh, appreciate everybody's time uh, on today's webinar. This has been a great discussion. I really appreciate it to our, our two speakers. Thanks for everything that you've shared today. Thanks for our audience. And, and again, thanks to Worksome for, for helping us put this together. Everybody have a great day. Hopefully we'll talk to you soon.